The reduced coenzymes that are formed in the citric acid cycle are high energy molecules and they utilize their energy in order to produce additional ATP. In the electron transport chain, the energy from these reduced coenzymes is released in a series of redox reactions that move electrons from one electron carrier to the next. As each carrier is reduced, meaning it gains electrons from the pre preceding carrier, and then is oxidized, which means it loses electrons by passing to the next carrier. Each reaction is favorable, meaning energy is released, so they're exergonic. And the electron transport chain is the series of biochemical reactions that pass electrons from reduced coenzymes that were formed in the citric acid cycle to oxygen and is coupled to ATP formation. So let's take a closer look at this. And so in the electron transport chain, I'll, I'll show you this in a second, each reaction is going to release energy until hydrogen ions react with oxygen in order to form water. The electron transfer will also cause hydrogen ions to be pumped across the inner mitochondrial cell membrane, and this creates what we call an energy reserve. And this is what's used to synthesize the ATP. There are four enzyme complexes that have all of the functional groups that are needed in order for these redox reactions to occur. There are various cytochromes. These are proteins that contain heme groups. And iron will cycle between iron 2 and iron 3 ion. Electrons are passed from the weaker to increasingly stronger oxidizing agents, and there is a release of energy for each transfer. So remember uh, from before I showed you the, a heme group, so this is a heme group, and here is a representation of a cytochrome. And we see this green ribbon here. This is an amino acid chain. The heme group, of course, is in red, and the iron atom is here in gray. Coenzyme Q, also called ubiquinone, because its ring structure with, with the two ketone groups right here, so one and two, is a quinone. Okay? So let's take a look at what's going on here. So here we have hydrogen ions that are being released for transport through the inner membrane at complexes 1, 3, and 4. And some of these hydrogen ions also come from the reduced coenzymes. Remember, they have the hydrogens. So we have the NADH and the FADH. Notice the NADH that interacts with complex 1 and here we have our FADH. Okay, So here is the cytosol. This is the outer mitochondrial membrane. This is the intermembrane space with these hydrogen ions. Um, here we have the inner mitochondrial membrane and the mitochondrial matrix right here. Also notice uh, the hydrogen ions. Notice hydrogen ions okay, are able to pass into the intermembrane space okay, through complex 1, uh, 3, and 4. Okay? And then notice here that the hydrogen ions okay, are able to enter the mitochondrial matrix through this ATP synthase. Okay, so this is like a hydrogen ion channel that allows the hydrogen ions to pass from the inner membrane space into the mitochondrial matrix. And here we see the ADP, okay, and that is phosphorylated producing ATP.
in the mitochondrial matrix. So some of the main points here. The hydrogen ion concentration difference creates what we call a potential energy difference across the two sides of the inner membrane. It's very important that this concentration gradient across the membrane be maintained because this is the mechanism by which energy for the ATP formation is made available. So the energy release drives the phosphorylation of ADP, right? So the conversion of ADP to ATP. And ATP synthase, that's the enzyme complex that I just showed you in that representation. Uh, this is the enzyme complex in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this is where, as, as I said before, the hydrogen ions cross the membrane and which allows ATP to be synthesized from the ADP. And then finally, we have oxidative phosphorylation. And this is the synthesis of ATP from the ADP. The energy to synthesize the ATP is the energy that was released in the electron transport chain. The reaction is both an oxidation and a phosphorylation. So the energy that is released from the oxidation of the reduced coenzymes, so the hydrogen ions return to the matrix and are used to convert the ADP to ATP. And of course that takes energy. And that energy comes from the oxidation of those reduced coenzymes. ATP yield from oxidative phosphorylation. Well, recent research suggests that each NADH molecule will yield about 2.5 molecules of ATP, and each FADH2 molecule yields approximately 1.5 molecules of ATP. Okay, um, this is just another slide. It shows where, how the hydrogen ions return, uh, we see that right here, return to the matrix by passing through this channel that is part of the ATP synthase enzyme complex. And so this is the conversion of ADP to ATP. So again, both an oxidation and a phosphorylation. So I got a quick question for you. Is the pH higher in the inner membrane space or in the mitochondrial matrix? This is the mitochondrial matrix. This is the intermembrane space. So is the P, where is the pH higher? Well, we see a lot more hydrogen ions in the inner membrane space, okay? And we see fewer hydrogen ions in the mitochondrial matrix. So the fewer hydrogen ions means what? It means a higher pH. So pH is higher in the mitochondrial matrix. Just a little test of <laughs> acid and base chemistry. Okay, so what I'm going to do here now is talk about carbohydrate digestion. And as we know, the first stage in catabolism is digestion. And this is the breakdown of food into smaller molecules. So digestion will begin in the mouth, continues in the stomach, and concludes in the small intestine. This is just a brief overview of carbohydrate digestion. So our dietary carbohydrates, starch, glycogen, sucrose, lactose, Digestion starts in the mouth, so alpha amylase, which is a, an enzyme, and this is found in saliva, this catalyzes the hydrolysis of the glycosidic bonds in the carbohydrates. Remember, enzymes act as catalysts in biological reactions. Starch and glycogen from plants are hydrolyzed to give smaller polysaccharides and, and the disaccharide maltose. Okay, so alpha amylase will continue to act on the polysaccharides in the stomach until the alpha amylase is inactivated by the stomach acid. Because remember, these um, enzymes are proteins 
and uh, they might have um, other non-protein parts associated with them but remember a protein will start to denature okay when we have an acidic environment so this is what happens in the stomach the alpha amylase will become inactivated by the stomach acid alpha amylase is secreted by the pancreas and it enters the small intestine where the conversion of polysaccharides to maltose continues and there are other enzymes that hydrolyze maltose sucrose lactose to glucose fructose and galactose the monosaccharides are then transported across the intestinal wall and into the bloodstream so glucose enters the cell from the bloodstream and when it does it is immediately converted to glucose 6 phosphate glucose 6 phosphate formation is highly exergonic so there's a release of energy and this is important it is non-reversible why is that well glucose 6 phosphate obviously has a phosphate associated with it so it turns out that phosphates cannot cross the cell membrane once the glucose is converted to glucose 6 phosphate there are several pathways available it just depends on the body's needs so if energy is needed glucose 6 phosphate undergoes glycolysis and that'll convert it to pyruvate and then pyruvate will be converted to acetyl coenzyme A which will then enter the citric acid cycle if there is glucose in excess it'll be converted to other forms for storage glycogen by the way of the glycogenesis pathway or converted to fatty acids by the lipid metabolism pathway we haven't talked about lipid metabolism yet it can also enter what we call the pentose phosphate pathway and this produces two major products NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate ribose 5-phosphate is needed for the synthesis of DNA and RNA which we'll talk about in the next module so let's go ahead and take a look at glycolysis and this is a series of 10 enzyme catalyzed reactions that break down each glucose molecule into two pyruvate molecules and also yields two ATPs and two reduced coenzymes this is pyruvate so let's take a look at what happens in the glycolysis pathway so steps one to three all right it turns out that to f the phosphorylation of glucose requires energy and it gets that energy from ATP this is a highly exergonic and irreversible step again phosphates cannot cross the cell membranes step two isomerization of glucose 6 phosphate to fructose 6 phosphate so that's a rearrangement and basically a six-membered ring is converted to a five-membered ring with this group here let's go ahead and take a look here steps one to five of glycolysis break one glucose molecule down into deglyceraldehyde 3 phosphate fragments okay so let's take a look here at step one. Oh, before I go any further um, we have actually there's an investment of two ATP molecules that is required okay so that's for steps one to five and then when we get to steps six to ten steps six to ten occur twice for each glucose that enters in at step one so steps six to ten produce two pyruvates four ATPs and two reduced coenzymes and this is per glucose molecule okay so let's go back up here and so you know first what we have here is our glucose and 
as we said, glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. So this requires energy from ATP. All right. So the glucose undergoes the reaction with ATP in order to produce glucose 6-phosphate and, of course, ADP. And this is a catalyzed reaction. Don't worry, you don't have to know the enzymes. So in step two, as I said, there's an isomerization of glucose 6-phosphate and that iser so here's our glucose 6-phosphate and it undergoes an isomerization reaction to produce fructose 6-phosphate. And again, this reaction is also catalyzed by an enzyme, the mutase enzyme, okay? Uh, so that's glucose 6-phosphate isomerase. That would be the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. So for step three, we have the fructose 6-phosphate, and again, it reacts with ATP. So that's two molecules of ATP that have been reacted here okay from steps one through three and this yields fructose one six biphosphate so notice the addition of the other uh, um, phosphoryl group if you will the fructose one six biphosphate has a six carbon chain and this is cleaved into two three carbon pieces and this is also an enzyme catalyzed reaction. The two products are dihydroxyacetone phosphate and deglyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay, So these are both three carbon sugars and the only product here that continues in the glycolysis pathway is the deglyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So this one here. In step six, we have two reactions that occur. So the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, that's this molecule here, okay? This is oxidized. Notice the oxidizing agent here, the NAD+. So it's oxidized to a carboxylic acid and then it is phosphorylated by another enzyme. So for this reaction in step six, we need both the reduced coenzyme nicotinamide at adenine dinucleotide and an inorganic phosphate. Okay, so both are required for this reaction here. Here we have the 1,3-biphosphoglycerate, okay? So again, this was, uh, step six was an oxidation, okay? Step seven, again, we have, um, now in step seven, this produces energy. We have the conversion of ADP to ATP, so there's a, the phosphate group from the 1,3-biphosphoglycerate is transferred to ADP to form ATP. Okay, so we have one molecule of ATP here. So we end up with 3-phosphoglycerate. And then in step 8, a phosphate group is then transferred from carbon 3. Okay, here's our phosphate group. So it's transferred from carbon 3 to carbon 2. So we can see that here. We see that transfer. Okay, so right here. Uh, here's the phosphate group on carbon 3 and here it's transferred to carbon 2 and this produces 2-phosphoglycerate okay and then step 9 this involves water so water is lost from the 2-phosphoglycerate and this produces phosphoenol pyruvate this is a dehydration reaction. We've seen dehydration reactions before. Dehydration reaction. 
Okay. So then finally, in step 10, we have the phosphate group from phosphoenolpyruvate is transferred to ADP to produce ATP. Okay. And we end up with pyruvate. Okay. So that gives you an idea of what's going on in the glycolysis pathway. So I went through all of this already as I uh, showed you the glycolysis pathway. And um, so this just tells us what happens at each step, step four and five, cleavage and isomerization. Um, and what's important here is that steps one to five, energy is invested in this part of the glycolysis. Two ATPs are required. And then steps six to ten, energy is generated. In other words, ATP is formed. Okay, so we have two ATPs that were spent in steps one to five and replaced in steps five and seven. Okay. Um, and in step 10, it makes sense that is highly exergonic. And the transfer of the phosphate group to ADP is irreversible. So the energy released is accounted for by rearrangement of less stable enol pyruvate to the stable keto form. Two ATPs produced in step 10 are the profits. So two ATPs were invested in the beginning and then the two ATPs produced in te step 10 are what we call the profits. So the important part here is the result of glycolysis. We end up with two pyruvate molecules. Okay, so glucose is converted to two pyruvates production of two molecules of ATP, and we also have the production of two molecules of the reduced coenzyme. So what happens to pyruvate? Well, it's going to depend on metabolic conditions. In other words, are we under aerobic or anaerobic conditions? Remember, aerobic is the presence of oxygen. Anaerobic would be in the absence of oxygen. So under aerobic conditions, pyruvate will be converted to acetyl coenzyme A, and it goes right to the citric acid cycle. Under anaerobic conditions without the oxygen, right, there's a lack of oxygen, pyruvate is then reduced to lactate. So let's take a look here. If the electron transport chain slows down because of insufficient oxygen, remember, we need oxygen okay, for that electron transport chain. So if it slows down because of insufficient oxygen, NADH concentration will increase. And that means the oxidizing agent, NAD+, is in short supply. We need this NAD+, for glycolysis to continue. If it's in short supply, glycolysis cannot continue. So the alternative way to reoxidize NADH is important because glycolysis, which is the only available source of the fresh ATP, must continue. So this occurs because of the conversion of pyruvate to lactate. So here we have pyruvate, and we have NADH serving as the reducing agent, and this is reoxidized to NAD+, and that becomes available then for glycolysis. So the, uh, this here is lactate. The lactate formation serves only one purpose and that's the production of NAD+. Once oxygen is available again, the lactate 
is reoxidized then to pyruvate. And then the pyruvate can be converted to acetyl coenzyme A and go to the citric acid cycle. So let's take a look here at the total energy output from oxidation of glucose. And this is the combined result of glycolysis, conversion of pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A, conversion of two acetyl groups to four molecules of carbon dioxide in the citric acid cycle, the passage of reduced coenzymes from each of these pathways that go through the electron transport chain, and the production of ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. The sum of the net equations for each pathway that precedes oxidative phosphorylation is shown right here. So we know that each glucose yields two pyruvates and two acetyl coenzyme A's. And what we go ahead and multiply the net equations for pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle by two. Okay, for each molecule of glucose, there are four ATPs formed. The remainder of that ATP is produced by the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So for each molecule of glucose, there's a total of 30 to 32 ATPs produced per molecule of glucose. So that's a lot of ATPs and therefore a lot of available energy. What we want to look at is metabolism in fasting and starvation. So, you know, think about being on a really strict diet. Let's say you're in starvation mode, right? So these metabolic changes in the absence of food are going to begin, of course, with a decline in the blood glucose concentration. And when that happens, you're, we see an increased release of glucose from glycogen. So all cells happen to contain glycogen, but most of the glycogen is stored in liver and muscle cells. So free glucose and glycogen represent less than 1% of our energy reserves and it's used up in about 15 to 20 hours of normal activity. So during the first few days of starvation, protein will be used up at a rate as high as 75 grams a day. Remember, you're always told that when you're on a diet that it's important to exercise as well because you start to lose muscle, okay? So that's very important. What will happen is what this protein is being used up, lipid catabolism, so the breakdown of lipids is mobilized, and acetyl coenzyme A molecules are actually derived from the breakdown of lipids. And this acetyl coenzyme A will start to accumulate. So that acetyl coenzyme A needs to be removed and it is removed by a new series of metabolic reactions that transfer the acetyl coenzyme A into what we call ketone bodies. So here are ketone bodies. We have 3-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. Okay, so let's uh, go back up here for a minute. Anyway, let's say starvation continues. And what will happen is tissues in the brain can actually switch over to producing up to 50% of their ATP from breaking down the ketone bodies instead of glucose. By about day 40 of starvation, the metabolism will stabilize at the use of about 25 grams of protein and 180 grams of fat each day. So as long as there's water available, an average person can survive in that state for several months. People that have more fat can actually survive longer, which makes sense. So let's take a look at the regulation of glucose metabolism. So normal blood glucose concentrations range from about 65 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. And here are two terms that you should know, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. 
hypoglycemia is when the blood glucose level or concentration is lower than 60 milligrams per deciliter. In this case, a person will feel weak, they might sweat, they get the chills, uh, fast heartbeat. In very severe cases, it can cause confusion, convulsions, coma, and even death. Uh, my dad happens to be diabetic and you know he watches his sugar intake and carb intake and all of that but when he goes out to exercise a lot of times he'll feel the weakness he'll start sweating he feels clammy and chilled and he knows that he needs to eat some sugar quickly so he usually carries around some little candies with him while he's out exercising Hyperglycemia, on the other hand, is higher than normal blood glucose concentrations, greater than 110 milligrams per deciliter, okay? So at about 140 milligrams per deciliter, I mean, you're, you're diabetic, and when blood glucose concentrations gets to 180 milligrams per deciliter, the blood glucose will show up in the urine. So the blood glucose is regulated by two hormones, insulin, we already know about that. When blood glucose concentrations increase, insulin is released. The function is to decrease the blood glucose concentration. And how does it do this? It speeds up the passage of glucose into cells for energy production. So it speeds up the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. It also decreases the blood glucose concentration by stimulating synthesis of glycogen. Remember the storage form of glucose, proteins, and lipids. The hormone glucagon is released when blood glucose concentrations drop. So what it does is stimulate the breakdown of glycogen in the liver and of course, when glycogen is broken down, glucose is released. Proteins and lipids are also broken down so that amino acids and glycerol can be converted to glucose in the liver. So I do want you to know about those two hormones. So this is a nice little representation of what's going on. Blood glucose concentrations rise. Insulin is released from the pancreas and this in turn causes the glucose to enter the cells faster the breakdown of glucose by glycolysis speeds up glycogen synthesis increases in the liver and skeletal muscles and synthesis of lipids and proteins increases when the blood glucose concentration falls glucagon is released from the pancreas glucose entry to the cells will slow down glycogen breakdown in the liver speeds up so breakdown of lipids and proteins to raw materials for glucose synthesis then takes place. And we'll talk about gluconeogenesis a little bit later. Okay, so let's take a look at diabetes. And diabetes is a condition that's due to either insufficient insulin or a failure of insulin to activate crossing of cell membranes by glucose. In other words, the receptors on the cell do not recognize the insulin. So there are two types, type 1 diabetes, that's insulin dependent, and type 2 is adult onset diabetes. Symptoms can include excessive thirst, frequent urination, abnormally high glucose concentrations in the blood and in the urine, and the body can waste away even though the person is on a good diet. Actually, my dad, he eats pretty well, and yet he's very, very thin. He has type 2 diabetes. Basically, what happens, the available glucose does not enter the cells where it is needed, and it spills into the urine. So symptoms result when available glucose does not enter the cells where it is needed. Okay, so here, Let's take a look at the metabolic pathways of glucose. We have glycolysis, lysis, that's decomposition. So that's where glucose is converted to pyruvate. Gluconeogenesis, 
Genesis is creation. So this is the synthesis of glucose from amino acids, pyruvate, and other non-carbohydrates. Okay. Again, glycogenesis. Again, genesis is creation. And this is where glycogen is synthesized from glucose. That's the storage form of glucose. And then glycogenolysis. Lysis, again, that's the breakdown. So the breakdown of glycogen to glucose. And then there's a pentose phosphate pathway. And this is the conversion of glucose to 5-carbon sugar phosphates. So let's take a look at each one of these. We're not going to go into any detail, but I do want you to know about glycogen metabolism. Glycogenesis, this is the biochemical pathway for the synthesis of glycogen. Glycogenolysis, this is the biochemical pathway for the breakdown of glycogen to free glucose. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose. And if you remember from a previous chapter, it's a branch polymer of glucose. Glycogenesis, the synthesis of glycogen. This occurs when glucose concentrations are high, begins with glucose 6-phosphate, and glucose 6-phosphate is isomerized to glucose 1-phosphate. So what you have is a glucose residue, which is attached to uridine diphosphate. And we see, so the uridine diphosphate here, this is the glucose here. And what happens is, the uridine diphosphate will transfer glucose to a growing glycogen chain. And this is an exergonic reaction, so energy is released. This occurs in the muscle cells if immediate energy is needed. And in the liver, it occurs when blood glucose is low. So these are some important facts to remember about glycogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, this is the pathway for making glucose from non-carbohydrate molecules. Things like lactate, amino acids, and glycerol. Remember glycerol from the fatty acids. This is very important during fasting and starvation and also intense exercise. This is an endergonic process, so it requires energy and it is non-reversible. So the lactate that's absorbed from the blood is converted to pyruvate, which is the reactant for the first step of gluconeogenesis. Let's take a look at glucose production during exercise. This is also called the Cori cycle. Gluconeogenesis requires energy. We said it's endergonic. So what will happen is during exercise, when this pathway is shifted to the liver, okay, as we so this here would be the liver. Okay, this is the, represents the liver. This represents the muscle. So when the pathway is shifted to the liver, then what happens is it frees the muscle from the burden of having to produce even more energy. So the lactate is sent to the liver, okay, right right here, and it's converted back to glucose in the liver. The glucose then can return through the bloodstream to the muscle, and there it can be stored as glycogen or used for energy production. And that's going to depend on the energy needs. The Cori cycle is most efficient after the completion of exercise. Anyway, this concludes the module, module 10. If you have any questions on any of this, please contact me, and everyone have a nice night.